All oh, right. <laughs> it wasn't quite one full minute. And it might be still be 12.59. I was just sharing with the team how excited I get each time we have one of these amazing discussions. I'm so proud of the uh, Museum and Interpretation Division um, and just the, the depth that these uh, conversations um, have. Um, and a student of history myself, um, I ascribe to the idea that without documents, um, you have little history you can fully demonstrate. Um, and here, we also honor oral traditions. Um, we're exploring all the different ways you can tell a story and help people to connect to history. And so we have an um, amazing scholar who will help us to understand James Madison um, much better in a very specific time period. Um, and without further ado, I introduce Kyle Stetz, our Chief of Interpretation, or Director of Interpretation. That's better, right? Okay. All right, and so we thank you all for sticking with us today and joining us um, for this afternoon lecture. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'm very excited to uh, have Dr. Angela Kreider here for this presentation. Um, Dr. Kreider earned her PhD from the Institute of the Liberal Arts at Emory University and has been an editor with the papers of James Madison at the University of Virginia since 2003. She edited four volumes of the presidential series of Madison's papers and co-edited a fifth volume. Uh, covering the years 1813 to 1815, and much, of, much of Madison's correspondence had to do with the War of 1812 and its immediate aftermath. More recently, she's worked on the Project Secretary of State series, editing volumes documenting Madison's direction of US foreign affairs in 1806 and 1807 as the ongoing war between Great Britain and France put increasing pressure on American commerce, natu na national stature, and territorial ambitions. So again, we're delighted that you all are able to join us, and we're delighted to have Dr. Kreider. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, can you hear me? Wait, I gotta turn this on. Okay, I think we're good. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming out today to hear about Madison's work as Secretary of State. Um, Kyle suggested that before I get started, I tell you a little bit about the Madison Papers Project at UVA where I work, so you know a little bit about where I'm coming from. Um, the goal of the project is to publish all documents that were written by Madison and all the letters that were written to him during his lifetime. Uh, it's a long-running project. It started in the 1960s at the University of Chicago. And it, uh, I believe it was in the late 1970s sometime that it moved to UVA. So far, the project has found more than 38,000 documents. And 44 volumes of those documents have been published. Um, there's one uh, coming off the press in probably about a month. And we've got seven to go. So we're getting there. Um, we do still publish printed books, but all of them are made freely available uh, online within about two years after they're published. And my comments today are going to be largely based on the contents of the volumes published so far in our Secretary of State series. So, when I started to think about the celebration of James Madison's birthday here today, it occurred to me to wonder whether he ever actually celebrated his birthday. And I decided that would probably be too hard to it would probably be too hard to answer that question, but I could find out if he ever wrote any interesting letters on his birthday. And um, it turns out that he did and that one of them provides a starting point for what I'm going to talk about today, his work with France during his years as Secretary of State from 1801 to 1808. So, here it is, 
written on Madison's 51st birthday, March 16, 1802, 222 years ago today. This is the copy that was kept for the State Department records, so it's in a clerk's hand, not Madison's. And I've added red lines on the images of the manuscript to indicate where the transcription came from. The letter is to Robert R. Livingston, who was U.S. Minister to France. And we can see that Madison wrote, We are anxious to know the result of your communications with the French government on the subject of restitutions. And he added that the uncertainties supposed to attend a fulfillment of the convention by the French government have excited a lively sensation in our citizens having claims under it and have produced applications both to the legislature and the executive urging a retention of the monies due to French claimants as an eventual fund for the justice stipulated to themselves. He goes on to mention that this subject has relations to the armament at St. Domingo. And at the end, there's a paragraph that Madison considered so sensitive that parts of it were encoded in the copy of this letter that was actually sent to Livingston. And those are the parts that are italicized in the transcription. And he wrote, the subject of your letter to Mr. King of the 30th of December is regarded by the president as not less delicate than you have supposed, considering the particular views which Great Britain may mingle with ours and the danger that a confidential resort to her, or Great Britain, may mingle with ours and the danger that a, con oh, I'm sorry, um, a confidential resort to Great Britain may be abused for the purpose of sowing jealousies in France and thereby thwart our object. So there's a lot going on here, um, and to unpack a little of it, we'll have to start with a quick background review. Thomas Jefferson took office as president in March of 1801. He had asked Madison to be Secretary of State, and Madison accepted, but James Madison Sr. died in February of 1801. So his eldest son had to settle the estate before he could go to Washington and start work. It is an interesting coincidence that Madison became the person with primary responsibility for the estate here at Montpelier at almost exactly the same time that he became responsible for US foreign affairs. Of course, he'd had long experience that fitted him for both jobs. He took the, uh, took the oath of office as, as Secretary of State on May 2nd, 1801. When he took office, he was certainly aware of the most re recent major event in Franco-American affairs, and this was the Quasi-War of 1798 to 1801, and it was called that because it wasn't officially declared by either country. France had been at war with Britain since 1792, and when the U.S. signed the Jay Treaty with Britain in 1794, the French government considered it a violation of the Treaty of Alliance with France that the U.S. had made in 1778 during the Revolutionary War. So, France started capturing U.S. merchant ships in retaliation, mostly in the Caribbean, but some on the U.S. coast as well. American armed ships were authorized to protect American merchant ships, but only to act defensively. The Treaty of Mortefontaine ended the conflict in September of 1800, but the Senate didn't vote to ratify that treaty until December of 1801 because although the treaty stated that France was to compensate the owners of American ships that had been captured and vice versa, it didn't specify how this was to be done or um, when. But in the end, the Senate agreed to kick that can down the road. 
And the problem of those American claims against France is a big part of what Madison is talking about in this letter that he wrote on his birthday in 1802. Since American claimants didn't know how or if the French would pay their claims, they wanted the US government to keep the money owed to French shippers in case the French didn't pay up. But the administration rejected this policy and also reluctantly agreed to pay part of what they owed to French shippers directly to the French agent in Washington, Louis-André Pichon. With the knowledge that the funds were probably going to be used to buy arms in Saint-Domingue, or what Madison called here Saint Domingo. Which brings us to the second major concern in French-American affairs at the time. The French colony of Saint-Domingue, or what is now known as Haiti, had achieved the greatest sugar production of any West, West Indies colony by means of brutal mistreatment of the enslaved people who worked there. In 1790, the year after the French Revolution broke out, the enslaved people of Saint-Domingue began a series of uprisings, and in 1793, the French government abolished slavery there in an attempt to pacify the rebels. A rebel leader named Toussaint Louverture joined forces with France in 1794 and gained control of the French part of the island, but French leaders became suspicious of him and things came to a head in 1801 when Louverture promulgated a constitution for Saint-Domingue that proclaimed him governor general for life, even though he still said that he was um, loyal to France. So, uh, the war between France and Britain had ended temporarily the same year, and so Napoleon could spare the 20,000-man army that he sent to Saint-Domingue to try to reassert French control there. That army arrived in February of 1802 under the command of Napoleon's brother-in-law, Charles Leclerc, and it proceeded with the armament that Madison mentioned there. Related to the situation in Saint-Domingue was the rumor that the Louisiana Territory was going to change hands. France had ceded the territory to Spain in 1763, and now many people believed that Spain was about to restore it to France because Napoleon needed a convenient source of supplies for Saint-Domingue and his other West India islands. And um, Spain at the time was too weak to resist him. And this transfer of the territory had, in fact, actually been accomplished by the secret treaty of San Ildefonso in, November, in October of 1800. But the Americans didn't have any real proof of it until late in 1801. And in February of 1802, Madison got this news from Rufus King, the American um, minister to Britain. And it raised two major questions that Madison had to deal with. First, did France intend to occupy New Orleans and the rest of the Louisiana Territory? Madison and Jefferson and many other Americans didn't like this idea at all. So preventing France from actually occupying Louisiana, even though it now owned the territory on paper, was the object that Madison warned Livingston to be very careful not to thwart. The second big question that Madison had to try to find out the answer to was what exactly was included in Louisiana? Specifically, did the transferred territory include the two Spanish colonies known as East and West Florida? So we'll look at some more letters to see how Madison went about trying to address these questions. 
Robert R. Livingston, the person wrote, that Madison wrote to on March 16, 1802, was a major Hudson Valley landholder, and he'd been Chancellor of New York for 20 years. He had arrived in Paris as U.S. Minister, or what we would now call Ambassador, to France in December of 1801, and so far he hadn't managed to get much information about Napoleon's intentions with regard to Louisiana. Madison and Jefferson soon sent letters to Livingston explaining some of the reasons why they didn't want France to occupy Louisiana, most of which he probably already knew. So, Madison told him that a French presence in Louisiana, or what he calls a mere neighborhood, could not be friendly to the harmony with which both countries have so much an interest in cherishing. But if a possession of the mouth of the Mississippi is to be added to other causes of discord, the worst events are to be apprehended. And Jefferson's letter to Livingston was somewhat less circumspect because it was a private one. In other words, it wasn't officially on the record. Um, Jefferson declared that because of New Orleans' position as a gateway to worldwide shipping for Trans-Appalachian America, it was, quote, the one single spot, the possessor of which is our natural and habitual enemy. And he went on to say that if France took possession of it, quote, we must marry ourselves to the British fleet and nation. So he was basically threatening war with France and an alliance with Britain. And the unstated assumption here was that France in Louisiana was far more dangerous to the United States than Spain, which still had actual possession of the territory despite the transfer. There was another reason that some people feared a French takeover in Louisiana. Madison and Jefferson didn't mention it in their official correspondence, at least, but Livingston did. In March of 1802, he wrote to Madison, God knows what would be the effect of garrisoning Louisiana with black troops which is by no means an improbable measure as they will not incline to keep them in their islands. And four months earlier, with rumors flying that Spain had ceded Louisiana to France, Madison had gotten a memo from Tench Cox, a political economist from Philadelphia who sent Madison a lot of advice. And um, Cox wrote, It is impossible to be too much on our guard against the consequences of a large detachment of Republican blacks from St. Domingo to Louisiana, accompanied by the sudden emancipation of the blacks there, meaning Saint Domingue. If the French mean to reduce the blacks in the islands, they may do it the more easily by sending the most warlike to Louisiana. Such visions of armed and dangerous black rebels next door to their own territories alarmed many white Americans, to say the least. And in October of 1802, an event occurred that emphasized the importance of Madison's and Jefferson's commercial concerns about New Orleans. The 1795 Treaty of San Lorenzo between the United States and Spain guaranteed the United States the right to what was called a deposit at New Orleans, which meant that produce sent down the Mississippi by U.S. farmers could be stored there in New Orleans until it was shipped. So in 1802, the Spanish intendant at New Orleans, Juan Ventura Morales, suspended this right in violation of the treaty. This ultimately meant that American goods couldn't be shipped through the port. And for Madison, this wasn't just an abstract political matter. 
he knew that his friends and relations in Kentucky were suffering hardship as a result of the shipping hiatus. In January of 1803, his second cousin, Hubbard Taylor, who was a former Kentucky state senator, wrote to him from Clark County, Kentucky. The late stagnation to our exports by the conduct of the intendant at Orleans, together with the injury done our wheat by the weevil, the low price of hemp and tobacco, makes our Mississippi trade produce us but little prospect this year. As to the remedy of the first of these evils, we rely with confidence on the general government, not doubting of every proper measure which the nature of the case will admit of will be speedily, and he probably wrote something like taken or adopted here, the part that's ripped out. But the actual reason that Hubbard, uh, that Hubbard Taylor was writing to Madison at this point was to ask what he should do about some of the Madison family's land in Kentucky, which he had been managing for years. He sent with his letter this list of parcels held in Madison's deceased brother Ambrose's name. And this was only a small part of the family holdings. Although Madison never made much money from these investments for a variety of reasons, um, it's clear that in 1802 and 1803, he wasn't just a disinterested bystander with regard to events like the closing of the New Orleans deposit that could influence the value of Western lands. Some Westerners were in fact demanding that the government take New Orleans by force. And on December 17, 1802, Madison sent Livingston a letter hinting at this possibility. This was a private letter showing more, about, more of his feelings about the matter than he could in an official one. And he basically said that the 200,000 militia members living on the Mississippi River and its tributaries could take control of New Orleans at any time if their shipping rights were violated, which should make Napoleon think twice about acting on this frenzy, as Madison called it, for occupying that city. The reaction to the closing of the New Orleans deposit gave the administration the opportunity to appoint James Monroe as a special envoy to join Livingston in negotiating with France to buy New Orleans and the Floridas. Monroe was known as a supporter of Western interests, and his appointment was a signal to Westerners that the government was addressing the problem at New Orleans. Jefferson and Madison wanted the Floridas for many of the same reasons that they wanted New Orleans. The Mobile River and the other outlets to the Gulf of Mexico, of course, weren't as big as the Mississippi, but Spanish control of them inevitably meant trouble for American shippers. To help the negotiation along, Congress passed a $2 million appropriation to purchase New Orleans and the Floridas. It was expected that France would demand more, but part of the cost was to be defrayed by an agreement that the United States government would take responsible for paying those claims that its citizens had against France from the Quasi-War. So on March 2nd, 1803, Madison sent his instructions for the mission to Livingston, Monroe, to Livingston and Monroe. He wrote, the object in view is to procure by just and satisfactory arrangements a cession to the United States of New Orleans and of West and East Florida or as much thereof as the actual proprietor can be prevailed on to part with. And there was no hint here that the United States might consider buying all of Louisiana. Madison went on to list the reasons he thought France would want to make the sale now. It was widely expected that the temporary peace between France and Britain would break down, and indeed, 
Britain declared war in May of 1803, and it was true that Napoleon really needed money. Finally, one of the West India Islands that Madison mentioned was Saint-Domingue, where Napoleon's brother-in-law, General Leclerc, had died of yellow fever. And the army of rebellion was poised to defeat Leclerc's successor, the Viscount Rochambeau, and establish the Republic of Haiti on January 1, 1804. But that was in the future at the time. After listing and refuting a number of reasons why France might nevertheless think it would still be a good idea to hang on to Louisiana, Madison got down to money matters. And this still is the same letter. They just switched clerks, so the handwriting is different. Um, he said that Livingston and Monroe should offer $5.5 million for New Orleans and East and West Florida, which was 30 millions of livres tournois at the rate of $1.1 for every six livres. And here you can see that the 30 is in code with a helpful note from the clerk, C cipher. <laughs> so Livingston and Monroe were to pay as little as possible, of course. Whoops, skipped one, sorry. Okay, here we go. Um, but if they had to pay more, Jefferson had said that they go, could go as far as 50 million, which 50 million livres, which was just over nine million dollars. So um, let's see here. Where is the code? There it is, 50, 50 million. Well. The price went way over nine million in the end, but that was because, as we all know, Livingston and Monroe bought the whole Louisiana territory, not just New Orleans and the Floridas. On May 18, or on 13 May 1803, they wrote to Madison. We have the pleasure to transmit you a treaty which we have concluded with the French Republic for the purchase and cession of Louisiana. An acquisition of so great an extent was, we well know, not contemplated by our appointment, but we are persuaded that the circumstances and considerations which induced us to make it will justify us in the measure to our government and country. The rest of the letter was an explanation of why they'd bought the whole thing, starting with the fact that Napoleon had decided to sell all or nothing. So they had agreed to pay a total of 80 million francs, which is usually rounded up to $15 million. About $3.6 million of this, or 20 million francs, was to be paid to our citizens in discharge of the debts due to them by France under the Convention of 1800, the treaty with France that had ended the Quasi-War. So the question of whether France would occupy Louisiana was answered. It would not. And Madison wrote to Livingston and Monroe congratulating them on a job well done. After discussing more details and logistics, he wrote here, I only add the wish of the president to know from you the understanding which prevailed in the negotiation with respect to the boundaries of Louisiana, and particularly the pretensions and proofs for carrying it to the river Perdigo, or for including any lesser portion of West Florida. And again, the italics in the transcription indicate the parts that were encoded in the copy sent to Livingston and Monroe. Madison was referring to the Perdido River, which today forms the boundary between Louisiana, I'm sorry, between Alabama and Florida, south of the 31st parallel. It was understood at the time to be the eastern boundary of what the British had called West Florida when they had control of it from 1763 to 1783. 
And before Livingston and Monroe, Monroe even got this letter from Madison, they came to the conclusion that the territory they had purchased extended at least to the Perdido River on the east. On June 7th, 1803, they wrote, we are happy to have it in our power to assure you that on a thorough examination of the subject, we consider it incontrovertible that West Florida is comprised in the session of Louisiana. Theirs were only the first of countless very complicated arguments about this. And the general opinion in the years since seems to be that they were wrong. But be that as it may, the fact is that neither of the Floridas was officially transferred to the United States on December, or so I should say with the rest of the Louisiana Territory on December 20th, 1803. And because of that, France was able to use the Floridas as a bargaining chip in its relations with the United States through at least 1808. So Madison's workload did increase as a result of the Louisiana Purchase because as Secretary of State, he was in charge of the administration of US territories. And setting up new territorial governments in Louisiana required some complicated arrangements. But US relations with France did simmer down a little bit briefly after the treaty was ratified. In the meantime, in Paris, Robert R. Livingston had told Jefferson and Madison that he was ready to come home. So Jefferson appointed John Armstrong, who was Livingston's brother-in-law, to re replace him in Paris. Armstrong didn't leave New York until September of 1804, and then when he got to France, he got stuck in Nantes on the coast because all the overland transportation was booked for Napoleon's coronation. So Armstrong finally got to present his credentials to Napoleon in November. And about a month later, he sent Madison a letter saying that a direct negotiation between the United States and Spain for the Floridas wouldn't work because France was determined to get money out of any transaction involving that territory. And here he uses, the older, he uses an older meaning of the word job, which is a transaction in which duty or the public interest is sacrificed for the sake of monetary gain or personal advantage. In the same letter, Armstrong mentioned that part of the reason he was getting nowhere in Paris what was that Napoleon was very upset about the US trade with Haiti. Despite, uh, because despite the disastrous defeats that the French had suffered in Saint-Domingue and the establishment of the Republic of Haiti in January of 1804, Napoleon wasn't giving up on it. So Livingston, I'm sorry, we're on Armstrong now. Armstrong here was hinting that if the trade to Haiti from the United States could be stopped, Napoleon might be more willing to help the United States get the Floridas. Madison wasn't enthusiastic about the idea of a Haiti embargo. First of all, on basic principles of free trade, the Haiti trade was very profitable for many American merchants, not to mention the farmers and other producers of commodities that were shipped there. There was no doubt that the Haitian rebels were buying and benefiting from all of these goods. And these rebels claimed to be following the example of the United States in establishing a free republic. So it would be a bit ideologically inconsistent to deprive them of the supplies they needed to do this. On the other hand, since the United States was at peace with France, aiding and abetting the revolution against French rule in Haiti was also quite problematic. In March of 1804, Madison hinted at the possibility of an arms embargo in a letter to Livingston, 
writing that the administration didn't want to have to enforce such a measure, but adding that weapons should probably be kept out of hands likely to make so bad a use of them. He was writing about hands making bad use of weapons because reports that rebels had massacred large numbers of French white people in Haiti had started to arrive in the United States. Some in Okai here and some in Genev here. News like this made American slaveholders and other Americans as well more, even more nervous than they already were about formerly enslaved people of color gaining power in Haiti. American newspapers had also reported before this that French forces had massacred black people in Haiti and elsewhere. So, information that atrocities had been perpetrated on both sides was readily available. And white Americans, for the most part, emphasized whichever aspects of the story promoted their own political and economic interests. Madison Jefferson knew that slaveholders who had reason to fear the consequences of the Haitian Revolution, had more votes in Congress than the merchants who ran guns to Haiti. So the administration decided to pursue an arms embargo with the hope that it would help them gain Napoleon's cooperation on the Floridas. And in March of 1805, Congress passed a law prohibiting the sale of arms from US ships in the West Indies. But as Madison expected, the embargo proved to be unenforceable and it didn't really serve its diplomatic purpose because Napoleon objected to any US trade with the Haitian rebels, not just an arms trade. So both kinds of trade continued um, as did the French complaints about them. But late in 1805, things changed. Madison got a heavily encoded letter from Armstrong conveying an indirect offer from the French government to medi mediate a negotiation between Spain and the United States for the US to purchase the Floridas. This was the latest version of Napoleon's plan to get money out of the Floridas. He would encourage Spain to sell the territory to the United States and then appropriate most of the funds for his war effort. Ten million dollars, I mean, yeah, was the suggested price. As Madison and the cabinet and the rest of the cabinet knew very well, Spain owed France so much money and was so militarily weak that it wouldn't be able to re resist. So they decided to try it. Congress passed a stronger law placing a complete embargo on US trade with Haiti. Madison didn't like it because he believed it went beyond what France had a right to demand from the United States. But he told Armstrong it was, quote, expedient for the present and the eventual welfare of the United States, which meant that it was intended as an additional inducement to Napoleon to carry out his end of the bargain. Congress passed a $2 million appropriation for, quote, defraying any extraordinary expenses in US foreign relations, but it was well understood that the money was to be a down payment for the Floridas. The cash came at a cost for Madison, though. A few months later, on the floor of the House of Representatives, his political opponent, John Randolph, said that Madison had told him that, quote, France was the great obstacle to the compromise of Spanish differences, that France would not permit Spain to come to any accommodation with us because France wanted money and that we must give her money. 
And Randolph went on to say, I considered it a base prostration of the national character to excite one nation by money to bully another nation out of its property. And from that moment, my confidence in the principles of the man entertaining those sentiments died, never to live again. He was, of course, talking about Madison. Madison drafted a refutation of these accusations. In one long, convoluted sentence, he said that neither he nor anyone in the administration had ever considered using the appropriated funds for anything other than a legitimate purchase, or nor had they considered paying the money to a country that did not own the territory in question. This, of course, evaded Randolph's point, which was that everyone involved knew that France would take the money after it was paid to Spain. You can see that Madison wrote at the top, for the public, if found expedient, but the refutation was never published. So part of the administration's plan was for Armstrong and James Bowden, who was U.S. Minister, minister to Spain, to work together on the negotiation. But the two ministers soon had a falling out because Bowden sent word of the French proposal to Spanish authorities after Armstrong had told him about it in confidence. And things went downhill from there. Whether owing to Bowden's faux pas or Napoleon's conclusion that the Americans wouldn't offer enough money, the French government didn't carry out their end of the bargain. And in November of 1806, Napoleon issued the Berlin Decree, which declared a blockade on all British ports. It was a paper blockade because France didn't have the sea power to actually put ships in front of all those ports. But it also potentially gave French admiralty courts the power to confiscate the cargoes of captured American ships if there was evidence that the cargo was British or that the ship had stopped in a British port. This would violate the Treaty of 1800 between France and the United States, which provided for free trade. It took Armstrong nearly a year to get Napoleon to say whether or not he would enforce the Berlin Decree against the United States in violation of the treaty. And in the meantime, numerous American ships were captured and taking care of the American sailors who were stranded by such events was one of the most important duties of American consuls in France. But in September of 1807, Armstrong wrote to Madison that the emperor had declared that there would be no exceptions in the enforcement of the Berlin Decree. In the meantime, in January of 1807, the British government had announced an order in council retaliating against the Berlin Decree. It prohibited American ships and those of other neutral nations from trading in or between the ports of Britain's enemies. And in December 1807, tit for tat, Napoleon issued the Milan Decree, which extended France's paper blockade to all European ports that weren't under direct French control. In combination with the British orders in council, this meant that American ships couldn't trade in any port in Europe or French or British colonies without risking capture and condemnation of their cargo by either Britain or France. Faced with what amounted to an obliteration of US trade worldwide, the administration decided to push for an embargo on American shipping. They believed that the economic pain an embargo would inflict on Americans would be temporary, and that the deprivation of American raw materials and markets would hurt France or Britain enough to persuade one of them at least to repeal their anti-neutral anti regulations, which would benefit all Americans in the long run. Madison had advocated such methods of commercial persuasion as far back as the 1790s, and he drafted 
Jefferson's message to Congress, asking for the embargo legislation in 1807, an immediate inhibition of the departure of our vessels from the ports of the United States. Jefferson submitted the message on December 17th, and Congress, um, and he signed the embargo into law on December 22nd. Because it was passed so hastily, it's not surprising that Congress felt the need to pass two supplements to it in the same session. And these added details, and they also provided loopholes. To make a very long story short, if the whole thing sounds dubious, it was. The embargo was unenforceable, but even so, it damaged American farmers and merchants more than expected. And it didn't hurt France or Britain very much. It was repealed on March 1st, 1809, when Madison was two days away from taking office as president. And the different pieces of legislation that replaced it led to some very sticky situations for him in that role. And if you want to know about the worst one, just look up James Madison and the Cador letter. So, to sum up, after the Berlin Decree of 1806 and well into Madison's presidency, trade issues dominated relations between the United States and France. But between 1802 and 1806, between the Louisiana Purchase and the Berlin Decree, the major driving force in U.S. relations with France was the desire to acquire East and West Florida. Madison reportedly denied this at least once. In 1805, the French minister to the United States, Louise Marie Thoreau, wrote back to Paris that Madison had said to him in conversation, when the pear is ripe, it will fall of its own accord. Meaning, that in time, the Floridas would inevitably drop into American hands. And speculators apparently agreed with that the U.S. possession of the Floridas was inevitable if their activity in West Florida after the Louisiana Purchase is any indication. They clearly expected that land prices there would skyrocket once the U.S. took over. But despite Madison's comment to Thoreau, he and Jefferson did try to speed up the process. They accepted the French offer of mediation, and they set up John Armstrong's and James Bowden's abortive mission in 1806, and they supported the enactment of two U.S. embargoes against Haiti on the premise that this would make Napoleon more willing to help them acquire the Floridas. Armstrong and Bowden's mission ended up being mostly just a waste of time, with a lot of aggravation for everyone involved on the U.S. side. And the worst consequence for Madison may have been John Randolph's comments impugning his character. But as for the Haiti embargoes, even though they were unenforceable, there's little doubt they caused some American merchants to lose money and many people in Haiti to do without supplies that they could have used. But ultimately, the embargoes also became part of a set of circumstances that led to more substantial long-term outcomes. In Haiti, chronic government instability, poverty, and violence. And in the United States, the successful use of race-based arguments in favor of secession and civil war. Which brings us to Montpelier and the enslaved community here. Like many of his fellow plantation owners and enslavers, Madison knew that slavery was a morally reprehensible and economically unsustainable system, but he didn't manage to find a way to work this farm, as he often called it, without the labor of enslaved people. Although he and his family were evidently not cruel to the people they enslaved, beyond the basic inhumanity of keeping them in that condition, Madison's own economic interests put him in political alliance 
with members of Congress who used race-based fear-mongering in support of the Haiti embargoes, the kind of language that could and often did lead to brutality. And partly as a result of the Louisiana Purchase, the demand for enslaved labor grew rapidly in the region now known as the Deep South. With very bad prospects for many enslaved people in Virginia who were sold south, including some from Montpelier after Madison's death. Along with the problem of enslaved labor, two other difficulties, limited soil fertility and shipping restrictions like the Berlin and Milan decrees meant that many Virginia plantations and farms, Montpelier included, struggled and often failed to sustain themselves economically. From a young age, Madison knew the importance of having good land, having the labor to work it, and having good markets. It took all of these to create prosperity for farmers and plantation owners, to create the kind of leisure that enabled him to sit upstairs in the house across the way for several months, research the history of republics, and produce a draft of what became the U United States Constitution. And Madison was well aware of the tenuousness of that leisure and prosperity in Virginia as the record of his work on taxes and other financial concerns in the state legislature shows. And the fact that Montpelier as an agricultural enterprise rarely broke even reveals one reason why so many Virginians and other Americans moved west to new and more productive land during Madison's lifetime. And it also shows why Madison understood so well the importance of those Western settlers being able to freely ship their produce down the Mississippi and Mobile rivers to markets worldwide. Madison's work with France as Secretary of State also contributes to a conversation that happens here at Montpelier all the time about the functioning of a constitution or structure for government that enables democratic self-government to sustain itself. France was the first major, America, uh, major European nation to dethrone its monarch and transform itself into a republic, and many Americans saw some hope in these events. But France then rapidly succumbed to what Robert R. Livingston called despotism under Napoleon's dominance. Obviously, all this was in the future in the summer of 1786 when Madison sat in the room upstairs and studied the history of republics, most of which was at the time written in French. But it's worth thinking about how the economic concerns that dominated U.S. relations with France while Madison was Secretary of State, markets and shipping, land and the labor of enslaved people, might have contributed to keeping the Constitution that he drafted in operation until today. So, although Montpelier may seem like it's a long way away from New Orleans and Haiti, not to mention, despite its French name, from France itself, this place that in the dominant ideology of James Madison's time was considered his birthright, the fields and woods, the people who Madison, his father, and their families enslaved, the mansion itself, and the room where Madison thought about the history of republics. All of these helped to explain the significance of his work with France as Secretary of State. Thank you. Okay, um, let me see if I can get back to that so we can, um, 
Let's see. Is this the one? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the beginning part here is a transcription of this explanation by Armstrong about how he got this offer from the French government to do the mediation. Um, and it corresponds to, um, well, it's this transcription here. Um, this is Armstrong. Okay, Armstrong, the code he used has been lost. There's no um, copy of it available in uh, any records that have been found. However, you can probably faintly see here, I think, yeah, especially at the top, that this one was decoded by somebody who knew what they were doing. So somebody who had the code. Um, what we do at the Madison Papers is, uh, of course, we, we transcribe the interlinear um, transcript or decoding. But my colleagues um, have also reconstructed the, the code key based on a lot of letters where this kind of thing is going on. And you can, you know, with some work, I mean, it's not rocket science, but it's not really easy, um, figure out which numbers refer to which words and parts of words. A single number could refer to a whole word, a single letter or part of a word. Um, so, you know, it was supposed to be complicated because people weren't supposed to be able to figure it out, although they did. Um, but uh, does that answer your question about? Um, okay. How would you describe Madison as a personality, and how would you describe your feeling about him? Well, one of the things I realized early on, and it's pretty obvious, is that Madison was a scholar. Um, he loved to study. Um, about lots of things, but particularly about politics. Um, and I guess perhaps in conjunction with that um, and with the fact that apparently he had a pretty uh, wispy speaking voice, um, He's, he's often been represented as being um, kind of retiring or not outgoing. But the other thing I found out quickly was that um, many people reported that in, um, I guess, in private company, in, in unofficial situations, he was actually kind of a raconteur. Um, and going so far as to, you know, not being averse to telling dirty jokes and that kind of thing. Um, and so he did have a sense of humor. Um, he loved his wife very much. Um, he, he was uh, definitely a well-rounded human being. Um, I will say that he, he had no natural talent or inclination to be a soldier or a military person. Uh, apparently, he tried once when he was very young and the Revolutionary War was just getting started and he was participating with the militia um, here in Orange County. If I remember correctly, he fainted. Um, at the, at the, um, when they were mustered. Um, and that was part beca partly because he had an, a long-term um, medical condition that some people might think might have been related to epilepsy. Um, uh, it didn't 
keep him from living a very, very long life, though, obviously. Um, but, well, I guess, I guess I'll just wrap it up there. Um, you know, he, he was a scholar. He was um, a real human being. Um, well, I did think of one more thing I want to say. Sometimes, you know, um, his political reason kind of makes my mouth drop. Reasoning kind of surprises me. Um, but I realize that in so many situations, we have only part of the record. And um, the other thing is that despite being a scholar, he was very, very, very committed to the American Republic. And he was willing to, um, you know, step out on a limb in numerous ways to do what he thought was best for the country. to um, medicine, uh, being an ambassador, ambassador to France and his relationship to France during the revolution, etc. I recall when Lafayette made his tour, that he and Monroe met with Lafayette in a very emotional, close connection. Do you have any information about his relationship or his communications with Lafayette, especially during the revolution and while he was imprisoned? Um. Well, Madison uh, never went to Europe. Um, Jefferson was a, an ambassador in France, um, but Madison did have a relationship with Lafayette, obviously, from the time of um, the Revolutionary War. And I don't know so much about their relationship from that time. When Madison got to be Secretary of State, my impression is that he and Lafayette, although cordial, were not close friends. Lafayette's relationship with Jefferson was much more, um, well, I guess, uh, cordial than, than Madison's and Lafayette's. However, Madison was in charge of the um, congressional, I guess, gift or grant to Lafayette in uh, Louisiana, in New Orleans. Um, and I can't remember the date on that, but obviously Congress would have done that after the Louisiana Territory was acquired. This was to compensate Lafayette for his services to the United States in the Revolutionary War. Lafayette wrote repeatedly to Madison about this, about how much he needed the money and how grateful he was to Madison for all that Madison was doing for him. And could Madison just try to speed it up a little bit? And um, Madison rarely wrote back, which is not really uh, indicative of anything about his relationship with Lafayette because he was very busy and there were many, many people who he rarely wrote back to. Um, but yes, from what I've heard, they did meet again when Lafayette made his tour. And I'm sure that it was quite, um, quite a meeting for both of them with all that had passed. Thank you so much again, Dr. Kreider. Thank you all for coming and helping us to commemorate Madison's birthday. Please enjoy the rest of uh, the beautiful day we have here at Montpelier. Thank you so much for attending.